Welcome to BB101 course at IIT Bombay. Professor Srivastava is going to deliver his lecture in Molecular and Cellular Biology module shortly. Please mute your microphone and be ready with pen and notepad to take notes. Thank you. Welcome to PB101 course at IIT Bombay. Please mute your microphone and be ready with pen and notepad to take notes. Thank you. Hello everyone. Welcome to PB101 Molecular and Cellular Biology. Cells are fundamental units of life. The tiny microscopic structure is composed of number of organelles. Each cell type has distinct characteristic features. The cell is made up of basic organic molecules like carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, etc. In this lecture, Professor Srivastava shall walk you through the cells describing its various components, mentioning the characteristics of different types of cells. Hello everyone, welcome to BB101 course. I'm Sanjeev Srivastava. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the cell and molecular biology module of PB101 course. Before I start, I'd like to give you the course overview. So this course has three modules. First is molecular and cell biology, physical biology, as well as biomedical engineering. Before mid sim there'll be two instructors, myself and Professor Rahul Parwar, and we will teach you MCB module. After mid sim there will be physical biology module, which will be taught by Professor Ambrish Kumar, and then biomedical engineering by Professor Neeta Kanekar. To make sure that you are not uh, overwhelmed with uh, exams only at the end, we are going to have quizzes throughout the lectures, and each instructor is going to have quiz of five marks. Then for the mid sim only the uh, MCB modules will be covered for the questions from Professor Rahul Parwar and my uh, uh, sections. And those will be 20 marks each. So 50 marks before the uh, your mid sem till mid sem And after mid sem Professor Ambrish Kumar module will have 25 marks for the end sem And Professor Neeta Kanekar will have 15 marks for the end sem So module 1 has uh, 50 marks. Module 2 has 30 marks. And module three, you will get 20 marks. I hope the uh, marks distribution and scheme is now clear to all of you. To pass the course, minimum 30% is the requirement. Regarding my lectures, uh, the MCB module, the first which I am starting. Today, I'll talk to you about introduction to biology and tour of a cell. Then uh, next you have a tutorial, which will uh, be essentially from this lecture, L1, and then some basics will be covered in this tutorial. My lecture two will be on the cell cycle. And then we will have introduction to metabolism, my lecture three. Genome and DNA tools will be lecture four. And then last two lectures will be on genetics, especially Mendelian genetics and chromosomal error, molecular basis of inheritance. Now, what you may see in the uh, blue colors here, tutorial uh, distributions. So tutorial two will have uh, contents from lecture two and three. Tutorial three will have contents from lecture four and five. And tutorial four will have contents from 
my uh, sixth lecture as well as Professor Rahul Pawar's uh, first lecture. Uh, further, uh, the quizzes, I have mentioned the red color here. Uh, so the first quiz, which will be for one mark, is will be from the first lecture, and that will be given at the end of the second lecture. And likewise, at the end of each lecture, there will be quiz, MCQ questions based quiz, which will be from the previous lecture. So I hope now you are clear for the five quizzes, which will be one mark each, five marks for my module and four tutorials and different six lectures. All the lecture contents and the curriculum will be based on Campbell Biology, 10th edition book. Lectures will be uploaded online and links will be provided to you so that you have access to all the contents. Even if you have poor connectivity of internet, you can watch that whenever you are available. I'm available on this email ID, sanjeeva at itb.ac.in. For any quizzes, we will have two mod type of uh, modalities. One will be Kahoot, and second will be online Google form based. Just a couple of uh, instructions towards my lectures. So I will try to upload all the lectures uh, at least one day before so that you have time to go through the contents. And that will really help you to overcome all the bandwidth issue, internet connectivity issues, right? Along with the video, uh, in the video description, I will provide you a link, which will have a Google form link, where you can type your questions. And those questions, I can take it in the live class. So now what is happening uh, is the first lecture, let's say I'm uploading in YouTube, but I'm still available in the lecture slot, which will be for the live class, right? And in that, I'm first going to revise you the important concepts once more. So that if something was not clear, I'll again repeat that few important concepts. I may also add a couple of new examples and case studies in the class time. And then I will first take the questions from the uh, Google form, which you have filled. Uh, and try to answer some of those questions. Uh, just think about, you know, we have almost 700 students in each batch, which will be a huge number. So a lot of people asking things randomly or, uh, you know, having so much online chat will be quite tedious. At the same time, if you have thought about you, the lectures beforehand, you have gone through the contents and write your queries in the Google form, it will be probably more streamlined. It is possible that 10 students have similar question to clarify a concept given in a slide, which was not clear to you. And I can explain that again. So it will be much easier for all of us to uh, run the course modalities in this manner. Nevertheless, I'm available for any online uh, points and comments and questions uh, during the class time. So uh, as I mentioned, at the end of each class, we will have a Kahoot quiz. Kahoot is uh, one of the online gaming system, which is pretty popular. And we like it very much for uh, doing the quizzes for, uh, for this type of courses. Even in my uh, you know, physical courses when I teach at IIT Bombay, uh, especially BB101, I still really enjoyed playing the quiz uh, like game on your mobile device. So we'll do that. Uh, that will be Kahoot quiz for, uh, but this quiz will be given to you for practice every day. So one quiz will be like a couple of questions for you to refresh the concepts and get acquainted with the MCQ questions, right? But after that, you, you'll be given 10 questions uh, which will give you one marks from the uh, Google form uh, based stuff, which will give you 10 minutes or so, so that uh, you uh, have limited time to finish those quiz and you can do that for one mark. So uh, practice quiz will be given uh, end of each class, each lecture, so that you are familiar with the concept, you're familiar with the MCQ type of questions. And Google form based quiz will be given at the end, which will be towards your evaluation. And uh, the quiz is going to serve your attendance as well. Attendance is going to be mandatory. Uh, barring, uh, you know, any exceptional case which you may have, which you have to inform me ahead of time. Uh, attendance is going to be mandatory in the course. And quiz is going to be live. So every lecture in that way, I will have all of your attendance. Uh, based on the quiz uh, participation as well, right? So I hope now you are clear with the course modalities, the lectures, 
uh, lectures are going to be in two ways. One is I'm going to upload the lectures ahead of time so that you can watch the lecture, ask for any uh, doubts to be cleared. And second, in the live class lecture time, I'm again going to repeat some of the important concepts, clarify your doubts, and then we will play Kahoot game as well as the quiz for the uh, uh, your one marks for each class. So let me give you outline of uh, today's presentation. First, I'll try to talk about why uh, we are you know, offering this course, Biology for Engineers. And I'll try to give you some examples of how biology have really benefited uh, from engineers. And engineers have made some very nice observations from the nature, which has resulted into some devices and certain novel products, which are otherwise not possible. Also, you will see huge increase in, uh, you know, the, the big business tycoons, the, all the big companies who are really venturing into the uh, biology projects. I'm sure I don't have to emphasize anymore after COVID-19, how important it is to uh, understand biology and medicine. And that is something now whole world has recognized. But then in the uh, second part, I'll talk to you about various properties which are associated with life especially about the cell and its properties. I'll give you a tour of a cell and try to differentiate prokaryotic, eukaryotic cell and how some of these important concepts have led to the evolutionary theories as well. So today's learning objectives allows will be first, the concept for uh, biology for engineers. Second is, the compartmentalization, the prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. And third, the complexity of the cell, which is one of the fundamental unit, a living unit, but that is much greater than the sum of its parts. So while each of these important parts are very crucial, different cell organelles, but how together they're able to make it the a living unit, which is quite important for the uh, all the organisms. All right, so this question comes that why biology for engineers, right? I'm sure many of you uh, would have apprehensions that why to study this course, BB 101, and why to study biology while you've already decided to move ahead in your career with the engineering discipline, right? Uh, some of you may have even liked biology in the past and you did not get uh, an opportunity to study uh, biology because you have shifted towards engineering uh, uh, track, right? Uh, so. A reason for offering this course is that given the situation, how uh, biology has become, biology and medicine has become so important, uh, and especially in the 21st century, uh, it is really important to apply uh, various type of biological principles and utilize different type of engineering skills together to come up with the new products, new designs, and new solution, which is not possible otherwise. Uh, you know, most of the time we work in uh, engineers are different and uh, medical uh, practitioners are different, biologists are different. Everybody works with their own comfort zone in their own area. Can we combine this uh, strength, this knowledge, and make it more interdisciplinary and try to come up with the solution which were not possible earlier? COVID-19 definitely offers that uh, opportunity where now you see that how uh, one is able to come up with the new solutions by applying knowledge from different group of people, you know, different uh, set of uh, scientists from whole world, they came forward, worked together, and tried to provide some new solutions, which was otherwise not possible. So in this manner, uh, the scientific community has started showing the strength by working in the interdisciplinary manner. Most of the top institutes in the world, you name the, you know, the big institutes, which uh, you probably uh, you know, are aspirant to work at some point like MIT, Harvard, Stanford, uh, UC Berkeley, all of these top institutes or Oxford, Cambridge for that matter, uh, all of them have very strong uh, biomedical engineering or biological engineering uh, or bioengineering uh, departments where engineers, doctors, uh, other basic scientists, they all work together. Our own department of biosciences and bioengineering is a good example where we have people from medical background, we have people from engineering background, people from basic biology background. So a good uh, one roof where uh, scientists of different backgrounds, they all can talk and, and they can work in the cutting edge problems together. 
So let me now uh, share my screen and talk to you about why uh, you know some of these points which I emphasized. Uh, we can also try to uh, show the uh, published evidences for those or some credentials which are available. So many problems which we uh, are all aware of, right? Like which is beyond our individual domains or individual expertise. Uh, whether you think about population explosion, pollution, global warming, different type of natural resource depletion, biodiversity or deforestation, climate change, natural disasters, and diseases, whether we talk about cancer or infectious diseases like tuberculosis, malaria, and more recently now COVID-19. They don't have any boundary. They work for everybody. Everybody gets affected uh, in the same manner. So to tackle some of these major life problems, what we require is more interdisciplinary skills to find the effective solutions. And one of the good examples to, to get inspiration from is bio-inspired engineering. Many engineers who were not forced to study BB 101, but they just were very keen observer of nature. They made some keen observations from nature and design and tried to implement that in their own uh, devices and found some really novel solution. Let me give you a couple of examples here. Let's talk about transport. The learning efficiency from Kingfisher. This beautiful bird, Kingfisher, you look at this big design. It uh, dives into the uh, water and with very little splash, it can catch the fish. Now, an engineer in Japan, uh, E.G. Nakatsu, he was a very keen uh, nature observer and a bird watcher. He thought, you know, how uh, this kingfisher goes very silently in the water and uh, able to catch the fish uh, without making any noise and try to overcome that limitation by uh, trying to come up with a model of a train which used to make a lot of noise, this train with the flat end. Uh, when it passes from the tunnels and uh, different bridges, it used to make a lot of noise. And he tried to uh, make this model in the big shape and that really worked very well. And this bullet train, which are now one of the model examples for the, uh, uh, you know, the efficiency, energy and being very quiet and super fast trains. These are designed based on the uh, shape of the uh, beak of the Kingfisher. So this resulted into a quiet train less electricity being used, which can travel very fast. Think about how it was possible if he'd have not made this observation from nature. Waterproofing. Let's take some lessons of waterproofing from this beautiful flower lotus. Lotus leaves have these crevices, which are having the uh, rough surface microscopically, if you look at, look at them, and they can actually trap the air so that now this surface becomes uh, you know, really hydrophobic and water droplets will actually float on that. They will just roll down. So now this design, why it looks you know, very beautiful and one could just admire the nature about you know, look, looking at beautiful uh, flower like lotus. But there has been uh, you know, the uh, creative people who have watched this creatively and thought can we utilize that in some design. The company Green Shield Construction Chemicals, they try to come up with the paint which is built on the lotus effect. Think about even place like Mumbai, when we have so much rain in the uh, rainy season, the buildings look really ugly because uh, you know water cannot, uh, you know, the paint cannot hold so long, you know, in, in this kind of rain. So having these kind of lotus effect can probably provide you much more protection from the waterproofing and can give you more effective solutions. So this company came up with this particular lotus effect in their paint. Resulted into higher uh, you know, water and stain repellency, which is quite needed to keep the building clean. Let's take next example, which is about architecture. How some of the huge buildings, which require so much electricity, air conditioning, maintenance, even can you take some motivation, some lesson from termites? If you have been to some adventurous trip to a forest, you might have seen these kind of mounds. These termites, they uh, 
are famous to destroy the buildings and of course you don't like to see them around but when you see these kind of thermatarium you will find that you know inside they maintain very cooling temperature uh, passive cooling and the cool air that comes from these holes which you see here and you know that forces the hot steel air to go, go out from the top so now it has made its own air conditioning system where now it can keep its inside uh, you know really cool and it stays happily now the big buildings like this what is shown on the right side which is the east gate building in uh, uh, Zimbabwe uh, that was uh, uh, you know really thought to how to maintain the electricity and air conditioning and an engineer Mick Pierce he designed this building uh, and thought about how best one could try to maintain the uh, air conditioning system to be reduced and try to mimic what he learned from the termites and he utilized the same kind of uh, you know the holes and the air uh, ventilation system which has kept this building uh, quite cool with very little electricity and air conditioning. So this building only uses now 10% energy for ventilation as compared to the conventional buildings of that size. Tsunami alert system. Now let us take some lessons from dolphins. These beautiful dolphins, when you see them doing some shows in different places, they are very uh, beautiful, they play very well. They can recognize the call of their family individuals even as far as 25 kilometers away. And by employing some of the uh, frequency in their transmission system, they are able to recognize each other and they are able to communicate uh, to their different members of the family. So uh, a company, EvoLogix, they came up with a high performance underwater communication and sonar system underwater robotics, fluid dynamics, shape optimization. All of them were actually inspired, influenced from dolphin. And this dolphin resulted into development of high performance underwater modem system for data transmission, which is also currently employed in the tsunami early warning system in Indian Ocean. So these small observations can be so useful and they're practically uh, available for uh, catching up with uh, these kind of natural catastrophes. Fog harvesting technology. Some lessons from this beetle, which is in the desert, known as Stenocara gracilipilis. This uh, a beetle that collects the water droplets, even when it is uh, you know staying in the uh, desert system, and trying to use that. To, uh, because uh, you know it needs some water, so it tries to use that morning uh, fog and make those water droplets on its back surface and try to uh, get, get these uh, water droplets on the moisture rolled down into its mouth to uh, meet its uh, water requirements. A similar concept was uh, uh, you know utilized by a student, uh, Sri Chitre. He is one of the IIT Bombay alumni and then uh, MIT student. Uh, he developed this device, which is uh, influenced from this design of uh, desert beetle and tried to make these fences, uh, which could be utilized in the arid conditions. And in the morning time, these uh, water droplets uh, can be collected uh, in the bucket and, and the water utensils. And people who are staying in those areas uh, really uh, got uh, positively influenced from this technology which was the fog harvesting technology. And at least uh, partially it was able to overcome their uh, drinking water uh, requirements. So I hope you are uh, convinced that taking the motivation, taking the, uh, you know, some of the ideas uh, from the nature's creation and elements and, and trying to implement that into some new designs and models can really solve some of the complex human problems. What I gave you is very few examples. There are actually a lot. So many examples are there where you will see that how uh, engineers got really inspired from biology and bio-inspired engineering is really one of the area for you to look into it to see that how many models, how many designs, how many projects are really in the practice, which was otherwise not possible. 
in addition to these uh, bio inspired engineering uh, you will really see that you know all the uh, mega giants companies uh, who are working in the core engineering discipline they are also showing a lot of interest into the uh, different type of biological projects right and first example is this uh, google uh, brain project which is based on artificial intelligence uh, which combines the open ended machine learning research with information system with its huge computing uh, resources google has uh, several projects uh, other project worth mentioning is the uh, smart contact lens project uh, where they have these glucose sensors antennas capacitors and the chip is actually like in the sandwich between two contact lens layers uh, so now when uh, you know the tear droplets they go into this film uh, which if it contains glucose it is going to uh, reach to the sensor and that could be used for the real time monitoring of glucose think about the patients who are having diabetes they can really benefit immensely from these kind of devices other uh, major uh, giant is ibm uh, they have uh, several projects in the areas of computational biology and system biology and they are playing a huge emphasis about doing these projects ibm has this uh, you know super computing power uh, ibm watson uh, which has already proved its utility in different type of uh, cancer diagnosis and cancer uh, prognosis kind of advices uh, and more recently it also uh, has shown its worth in the covid-19 time so uh, ibm uh, this watson that works on essentially data resources uh, artificial intelligence and blockchain technology and uh, it's you know during this particular pandemic ibm has really showed uh, its potential and uh, community services by offering lot of its resources free like super computing power virus tracking system ai assistants all of them they offered in the covid-19 pandemic time so that whole community can benefit from these resources it bombay uh, which you might be surprised that Uh, we have so many engineering uh, faculty and a lot of engineering research is going on in the campus but there is quite a bit interdisciplinary research happening in the campus and uh, around 15% or so faculty members are also involved either only in the biology or in the interface of biology and engineering interdisciplinary projects are being done right and that as you can see on the slide it spans in different departments not only just in uh, biosciences bioengineering and chemical engineering and chemistry but also in many other departments which are actively involved in uh, doing bio research as well uh, looking at the strength and the interest of uh, faculty doing uh, biological and clinical research in the campus uh, we also have a healthcare research consortium at it bombay which includes different hospitals which are locally available here uh, in print tata memorial kem hospital hinduja and different diagnostic companies are also participating in that so all that provides a good ecosystem where you can see that you know uh, starting from taking an uh, an, an idea uh, which is quite important for a clinician to address uh, a real life problem and then coming up with a solution implementing that along with the technology partners testing them on the patients all of them is really possible because that uh, ecosystem has been provided to you uh different faculty members of it bombay they work on uh, different type of devices and uh, different sensors are being developed uh, while i cannot uh, show you a lot of example but i just picked a few this mobile based uh, portable diagnostic system for urine analysis uh, to look for the blood sugar uh, based testing it is developed by professor rohit shrivastava and his uh, lab and they already have several uh, startups and companies who have taken these products forward Professor B Ravi and his team has uh, been working on various type of uh, devices and implants which can help the patients who are having uh, knee problems or different injuries, and uh, the OrthoCAD lab and their devices from the BTK lab has been very popular and has really reached to different type of uh, you know different industries and uh, medical partners have already tested their products. Professor Devjani Paul and her team has worked on uh, these uh, 
sickle cell anemia based uh, you know point of care diagnostics to look for how the uh, rbcs they are different in the normal blood cell versus sickle blood cell and can that be utilized uh, to develop a diagnostic device at the poc which can be sent to the different remote areas for diagnosis purpose uh many uh, students who uh, studied at it bombay and uh, they really got influenced and got motivated uh, what they studied here in the campus and then they tried to pursue some of the uh, biological concepts in their career and dr uh, harbeet malik is one of the example i have just shown his uh, lab website uh, he got really influenced from uh, professor kekera one of the uh, senior faculty member uh, of uh, bio and bioengineering department and try to pursue his interest into the interface of biology and engineering uh, even when he joined as a faculty member in us dr vivek uh, jayaraman he uh, from the uh, you know aerospace designs he again worked on the uh, interface of biology and engineering with the neuroscience as an interest and dr chetan khosla uh, he is one of the very uh, distinguished uh, faculty at stanford and a well wisher and friend of uh, it bombay uh in fact you know in a in a meeting personally to him while visiting uh, at his lab at stanford along with director of it bombay that time professor devan kakkar he mentioned that you know uh, bb101 and biology courses are really important for all the engineering students of it bombay and every student in the campus should get that exposure and that statement what he mentioned was because of his experience of uh, working at stanford and looking at that silicon valley environment where engineers and google and all other you know giants they're all working together in that interface right and if uh, you want to come up with the devices and solution you need to have that fundamental knowledge from these technologies so uh, these are uh, i hope you know some of the inspiration which you can take and uh, think about how engineers are able to contribute in the interface of engineering and biology but more recently when the covid-19 pandemic came Uh, different faculty members of IIT Bombay from different departments they all contributed immensely to try to uh, understand covid-19 and provide some solutions while we have huge list of you know uh, uh, 30 40 faculty members who have all done different projects uh, to provide solutions i'll just you know show you very few here uh, one is the helmet patient interface hpi and this project was developed by uh, professor ramesh singh from mechanical engineering uh, department when they came up with the non invasive ventilators for the acute respiratory distress syndrome and think about the utility for the covid-19 patients who are having uh, so much uh, severe breathing problems and these solutions can be so useful for these patients professor ambrish kumar and his team made uh, uv portable devices and i'd also like to acknowledge that while we were doing some covid-19 research on the clinical sample we also utilized uh, professor ambrish uh, made uh, uh, lab made uh, designs and devices to transport these covid-19 samples so while it was so much fear to handle these covid-19 patient samples but in these devices which he made with the uv uh, uh, protection it was very safe to transport even with the taxi and with the you know with the local transport medium and uh, so his devices are being used in the it bombay hospital and other places Professor Inti Banerjee, uh, uh, she worked on different uh, solutions for COVID-19, and especially the self-disinfecting mask, and different other solutions which she provided are very powerful for the textile industry, so that they have more antibacterial, antiviral capacity. Even after multiple rounds of washing, they are very stable and they can provide protection against COVID-19. Tapestry is one of the very famous uh, name which you might have heard. developed by professor manoj gopal krishnan from the electrical engineering department of iit bombay they came up with this uh, smart uh, round uh, pooling technique which is uh, to do the pooling testing of covid-19 and this really became very much highlighted in various media and different other places so uh, i'm just showing you here a workflow of some of the work which we did in uh, covid-19 area my lab primarily works on the clinical problems Uh, looking at patients uh, blood sample plasma swab other type of biological fluids and apply that in uh, different problems like cancer and infectious disease like malaria during the covid-19 time we thought can we develop 
uh, some of the de detection system to detect the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And also when the patients are coming as a mild patient, can we make some prediction that these patients might be having uh, disease severity, might be uh, you know progressing, and these patients may be prone to the severe type of uh, COVID-19. So two problems we wanted to investigate. While I'll not go in detail about what we did, but just to give you a nutshell of it, when the patients are coming to the hospitals, their swab samples are collected, which is being taken for the real-time PCR analysis. Now, same sample we took as well. And by that time, we had no idea for, you know, what to, uh, how to do the protein extraction from these kind of nasopharyngeal swab, which is stored in the viral transport medium. We tried different extraction methods with a very simple and safe type of solution so that it can be implemented easily to the patient and to the hospitals. And we did precipitation with acetone or ethanol or isopropanol, prepared these protein solutions, digested them with trypsin, clean up these peptides, ran them in a technology known as mass spectrometer, which can separate these peptides and identify these peptide sequences, analyze that data, and develop some tests to detect these viruses. So one which I'm showing you here, we were able to detect from these COVID-19 uh, positive patients uh, some of the viral pr uh, proteins and their peptides, which belong to the uh, either uh, replicase protein, nucleoprotein, or the spike proteins. We were able to detect those and develop the test from the mass spectrometers, which is known as uh, SRM, Selected Radiation Monitoring Assay. We are also able to find the proteins which are quite different in the mild patient and severe patients, like what you see here, one of the protein angiotensinogen, like, you know, in the mild patient versus severe patient, you can see huge difference. Likewise, the polypoprotein B, fibrinogen gamma chain protein, many of these proteins which I showed you here uh, are showing huge response difference from the mild group and the severe group of patient. And we, uh, like these protein, we were able to come up with the panel of the protein, which could be useful for the patient's prognosis. You can make prediction that a patient might be prone toward the SARS-CoV-2 disease severity. And this could be very helpful for the clinicians to give more uh, therapeutic intervention or probably uh, hospital enrollment to these uh, patients. So again, we have patented these. And if you have more interest, I'll be happy to talk in detail at some point. But uh, just to tell you that, you know, uh, different type of instrument, technologies, concept from IIT Bombay has really uh, helped in the pandemic time to come up with the novel solutions. So what in this course we are going to talk to you is not the conventional biology, which probably you never liked it, to just mug around the names of various, uh, you know, uh, taxonomy and a different thing which you uh, never like. But what we are looking at more concepts, we are looking at uh, a very interdisciplinary research-based field, how different uh, scientists from the field of chemistry, physics, biology, mathematics, engineers, they can come up with the novel ideas and solutions to deeply understand the biological systems provide some of the solutions to the societal problems. And those problems could be addressed in different type of sectors. Currently, we are all looking into health sector very actively, but likewise, many times you have issues of environmental issues, pollutions, food is always going to be a problem. So we have to think about how to overcome many of these problems, how to do the brainstorming, put our strength and forces together and try to come up with a new biology for the 21st century. This led me to the first learning objective. So why this course? We want to provide you some good background of biological concepts, which could be relevant to different type of societal impacts. I'm sure biology has impacted all of us very recently, last one year in the lockdown and pandemic. We have seen how a tiny microscopic uh, creature could really change the world, right? So biology is going to influence differently all of us. And at in, in, your, in even your academic career, you will see it is going to impact you in some way. And it is better that you are prepared uh, with this subject. The knowledge what you acquire in the engineering discipline, of course, you should focus on those. But along with those, if you're also understanding some of the concepts of uh, physics, chemistry, and biology, I think those will be very helpful for you to come up with some more novel solutions. At IIT Bombay, especially in our department of biosciences and bioengineering, we also have uh, this uh, minors in biology courses, a basket of courses which you can take along with your major discipline. And those courses could be taken 
uh, along with your, uh, you know, these uh, major courses. And you can take some of these minor courses in biology. And those, then you can get two degrees. One will be major in your discipline and also minors in biology. And finally, I'm hoping that, you know, this course is going to at least make you appreciate uh, the effort uh, biologists and clinicians put in to understand the biological systems and to uh, address different problems. And if you feel motivated, probably you'll be able to come up with the new projects, new designs, new thoughts. And I'd like to say that many of the BB101 students are really you know, enthusiastic students and sharp uh, uh, brains. They came with us, they did a lot of projects, even in the COVID-19 work, which I showed you, Many of your senior from first year and you know other other uh, years of uh, uh, UG program, uh, they're all part of this team. Or almost 35 to 40 people who work with me on these projects, and some of them are also part of the patents and the publications which has just come from this work. So uh, we do see a lot of enthusiasm in the UGs, even if they're from engineering background. But once they like a subject, they can contribute into you know even. A new technology development, even new uh, drug designing, and different type of solution, which is not possible otherwise. Discuss which of the properties and processes are associated with life. The biological complexity is very difficult, very complex, which is really not possible to just explain based on the uh, genes and how many uh, genes we have. So uh, you might have heard that, you know, different genome projects, they gave us an idea that how many genes different organisms have. And only recently, like, you know, uh, not very recently, but at least in the uh, around year 2000, 2001, major genome projects got accomplished. And since then, many other organisms are being sequenced. And now we have idea that how many genes different organisms have. So like fruit fly that has uh, around 14,000 genes, C. elegans, roundworm, around 19,000 gene. Arabidopsis thaliana, 27,000. Human, Homo sapiens. Uh, estimate was around 25,000, but by now we know this around 20,500 genes are there. So by looking at them, you cannot tell that, you know, which organism is more superior, which organism is more complex, because the gene numbers are more or less same, right, in, in different organisms. The central dogma of life, which stars uh, from these uh, DNA, the uh, genetic material, and moves on to make the uh, information, active information in the form of RNA. And then from there, the proteins are being formed. This is known as central dogma of life, which involves the complex processes like transcription, which is from the DNA to RNA formation, and translation, which is from the RNA to the protein formation. So this entire, uh, uh, you know, the central dogma is very crucial for all the life processes. While each one of these biomolecules, whether we talk about DNA, RNA, or protein, they're equally important. They're all very uh, crucial for life processes. But if you think about the functionality aspect of it, so genes remain static throughout the life cycle of a given organism. Whereas the active components, the RNA, they are being transcribed which is going to provide you more active functional information. And then from there, proteins are being formed. And these proteins get modified in response to different type of stress, in response to different diseases. And body's immune system and immune response starts working on it to produce antibodies and produce the proteins to combat those responses. So proteins are very dynamic molecule, finally. And they are the one uh, which is really helping for protecting different, uh, uh, against different diseases, or they respond very well against different drugs. So they're very crucial. And studying these biomolecules comes under a different type of omics uh, technologies are being used. Uh, all the studying about all the genes comes under the field of genomics, which has quite evolved. Studying all the transcripts or RNA comes under the field of transcriptomics. Studying all the proteins, together in totality, comes under the field of proteomics. Uh, my lab primarily works on the field of proteomics, but also integrated omics to apply other technologies from genomics and transcriptomics. And by combining the power of these technologies and obtaining the information from these biomolecules, then we study them under the field of system biology. 
and that's where a lot of computing power and uh, you know different computational uh, uh, background people engineering students from computer computer science or electrical engineering they become very important to bring lot of programming knowledge and different type of simulations which can be run to analyze this kind of complex big data set and try to provide some meaningful information which is otherwise not possible if you just look at these uh, biomolecule in its uh, you know alone in isolation but if you make them in the together then probably that could give you more meaningful information which is applicable for the addressing different questions for physiology and medicine so different organisms if you just look at them uh, you know from outside just with their morphology they are quite different but when you analyze them at the biochemical level look at their dna rna or protein you will find lot of commonality and lot of similarity in in those this a uh, figure is shown for a bacteria e coli this is a model organism fruit fly drosophila melanogaster this is a plant which you probably recognize uh, thalecress arabidopsis thalia no, from the mustard family uh, plants this is c elegans round worm shown here yeast saccharomyces cerevisiae and uh, human homo sapiens so all of them look so different right and you can't think that you know there are some common elements in all of them but if you really analyze them at the molecular level look at some of the protein which are common in all of this these groups their structure their function the gene sequences you will find lot of commonality across all of these groups which really lead us to the concept whether they arise in from a common ancestor right whether there was a common ancestor from where all of these organism got origin the different properties and processes which are associated with life some of the beautiful example which i have shown here they all tell different type of uh, important processes involved in life for example butterfly taking the nectar for its energy processing a uh, sunflower beautiful orderly structure of the flower rabbit showing its uh, ear which is uh, doing homeostasis to cope up with the heat uh, while running very fast and looking at that environment to keep it cool show the example of regulation pygmy sea horse tries to mimic its uh, environment to protect itself from the predators in the sea environment looks very uh, red in the coral environment oak seedling or other plants or other organism for that matter shows growth and development to predators response to environment is shown beautifully by this venus fly trap which is close its trap rapidly in response to the uh, environmental uh, conditions and the damsel fly which is landing uh, it is getting trapped inside this uh, this flower reproduction is of course common phenomenon in all the life systems shown here is a giraffe with its uh, baby giraffe so from the organisms now let's move on to the uh, cell which is an organisms uh, you know the smallest and the functional unit and if you think about the uh, you know origin of life that itself is a very interesting uh, topic uh, but not the focus right now uh, it started you know billions of years ago right you know, on the time scale if you see here uh, almost 4.5 billion years ago earth formed different microorganism came around 3.5 billion years ago and probably the first primitive uh, cell came around 2.2 billion years ago with more oxygen atmosphere uh, which was conducive for uh, you know growth of the cell then different type of uh, you know cell and different organism uh, different macroscopic organism eventually came around 0.5 billion years ago and you've heard about the interesting stories of dinosaurs and then finally more recently the human being so it's still in the large scale of evolutionary history if you see human uh, we are still quite recent uh just to to zoom you into the uh, cell what we are going to talk now uh if you look at the human body uh, which is having billions of cells so think about our skin and uh, you know every component of body they are all made of the cell which is really microscopic a small unit and our body itself contains billions of cells right and each one of these cell which is rounded shape shown here they contains a small nucleus which is uh, contains all the genetic material they contain the uh, genes the dna 
and all the uh, genetic information which uh, you, you, you know uh, study for the dna and rna they're all residing in these nucleus the bottom part shows a more uh, evolved structure of the cell showing the in addition to nucleus there are different other organelle which is part of the uh, the cell to give them functionality and now if you compare these uh, the left side image with the right side image which is uh, shown a car and it nut and bolts you will find lot of similarity uh, that how uh, you know the cell different organelle they work together it's like you know the circuits are all connected with a master uh, circuit and here uh, different nut and bolts of the car they are all connected then only they can make a functional car and likewise a functional cell cannot be made if all these component don't talk to each other and make a functional unit so there are scientists especially uh, from stanford which try to create the cell electricity models uh, like this where you know like the circuits of the cell how they are governed and they are regulating different organelle and their activity so think about how the design and the concepts of electric circuits could be employed to study the networks uh, in the cell as well this slide again gives you the broad overview of uh different type of structures and uh in the scale which is uh, given here which you can see uh of course you can relate some of these you know egg which you eat uh, uh, every day uh on this time uh, on the scale uh, you know uh, but now what we are talking is things which are mostly going down so from 0.1 meter to 1 cm to 1 mm then microns 100 microns and then 10 microns so most of these cell which we are talking right now which is billions of cell what we have they are in this time scale right or, or this uh, you know the unit uh, from 1 to 100 micron right and when we talk about these microorganisms like most of the bacteria uh, our different type of cell they're all in this particular uh, scale of 1 to 100 microns now you go down and you start thinking about now these viruses these are much uh, smaller in size and that's also invisible uh, which is you know in the scale of 10 nanometer to 100 uh, micrometers and then you go further down and then now you can look at the size of different biomolecules of proteins and uh, you know these lipid molecules etc so different type of microscopy have really uh, been a powerful way to study these cell and understanding that which are the organelle which are you know part of the cell how they function uh, with their dysregulation what kind of diseases may happen so entire field of cell biology have really got benefited with the electron microscopy with the light microscopy and uh, much higher resolution microscopes like super resolution microscopes all of them have really enriched our knowledge of studying the cell and their behavior so uh, in this image you can uh, see that you know to study the cells in microscope uh, one could utilize different type of microscopy uh, based methods uh, while i'll not go in much detail about all of this that you know what the microscopy is about but uh, broadly you can uh, think about two different type of microscope light microscope and electron microscope so in light microscope the visible light that is passes through the specimens and then through these glass lenses you can now uh, look into these uh, images of the live cells so to look at the live cell essentially the light microscopy is being used uh now uh, contrary to that the electron microscopy being used essentially to look at the uh, dead cells right and uh, unlike what you see here in the uh, light microscopy so in electron microscopy uh, uh, it gets the beam of the electron which focuses through the specimens and the resolution here is going to be inversely related to the wavelength of the light and so these electron beams which are having much shorter wavelength uh, than what we uh, uh, have seen in the visible light and they could be utilized for the uh, scanning electron microscope or transmission electron microscope to uh, study the dead cells for uh, looking at the ultra structural detail of the cell you have to uh, of course you know kill the cell and you have to uh, fix those and then you can look into the uh, under the electron microscope whereas the live cell could be studied with the light microscope so uh, most of the images what we have shown here is essentially these are all different type of 
microscopic variants of the light microscope except the uh, scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope which is electron microscope based images all right so let us now talk uh, in more detail about prokaryotic cells and then i'll talk about eukaryotic cells so prokaryotic cells these were the first most primitive organism as i uh, mentioned earlier almost 3.5 billion years ago and they have really seen all uh, extreme environmental conditions right so that's where a uh, different type of diverse population to cope up with those environment has really resulted into the diversity in these microorganisms i'm sure all the time you are hearing about different variants of these viruses of uh, sars cov2 uh, this is one of the recent example but uh, think about over the billions of years uh, these microbes have really evolved into various type of natural variations so let me uh, show you one of the prokaryotic uh, cell uh, which is a unicellular uh, organism uh, and these are really uh, small but uh, quite well organized uh, overall uh, and within one cell they have to perform all the crucial functions of the life right so uh, the cell wall that is uh, quite important to provide the shape to uh, this bacteria or the prokaryotes and uh, inside there is a cell membrane uh, then there is a cell wall and then outside uh, the very uh, thick capsule layer is there so uh, often you have seen like at home when uh, you know a pickle is being made a lot of salt is added to avoid the uh, you know these pathogens and these microbes to grow because uh, you know the high salt can actually prevent the bacteria or other prokaryotes to stop growing in them and their actual content they get shrink because of the high salt uh, condition uh, and that's where uh, you know studying these composition of these cell wall and the capsule becomes very important now the capsule which is the outside that is uh, quite uh, crucial which is surrounded with the polysaccharides or the protein dense layers uh, it really provides a lot of protection uh, to the bacteria against the environmental conditions and then these are the sticky uh, fimbri which is uh, helping the bacteria to provide hair like appendages so that it can uh, attach to different substrates and then on the different uh, uh, you know scattered on the bacteria is also flagella there and those flagella could actually uh, help into uh, uh, you know motion and different type of activity of uh, bacteria they are composed mainly of uh, uh, three major part a motor the hook as well as the filament and they actually quite differ from the eukaryotes uh, prokaryotes they lack a nucleus defined nucleus within a nuclear membrane and what you see is the flow floating uh, free floating uh, uh you know dna uh, material the chromosomes uh in the cytoplasm of bacteria and that is known as nucleoid and then uh which is not enclosed with the nuclear membrane and then we have these ribosomes which are also free floating uh, in these cells so uh you know this very simple uh, single cell uh, structure which is not having any compartments uh which you will see more in the uh, eukaryotic cells where there are more organelles there and there is lot of uh, very defined compartments available so uh, this is the same uh, structure which i just showed you uh, and essentially describe that uh, you know these unicellular structure they uh, are without they are very primitive form they are without any defined uh, nuclear membrane and uh, their dimensions are you know very small usually 0.5 to 5 micron uh, whereas when we talk about eukaryotes they are those are much larger uh, almost 10 to 100 microns and these bacteria they are in different shapes they are sometime rod shaped they are spherical they are also uh, spiral shaped and based on those people can actually recognize which group of bacteria they are uh so in addition to these uh, bacterial chromosomes and the nucleoid which is free floating bacteria sometimes also have these circular chromosomes which is uh, extra uh, chromosomal material known as uh, plasmid 
and that could actually uh, help into the replication uh, and that is quite important uh, especially for the genetic engineering based experiments when we will be doing some of the genetic engineering dna tools you will see that uh, you know the extra chromosomal material plasmid can be actively used for uh, various type of recombination activities and uh, other genetic engineering based approaches let me now describe you the uh, the bacterial cell wall uh, because that is quite crucial to understand the membrane structure so uh, uh, here what you see these are uh, you know in addition to plasma membrane there is a peptidoglycan layer which is a modified uh, sugar which is cross linked with uh, some small polypeptides and these are quite important to uh, uh, you know in the bacteria to uh, extend on their surface and based on this composition of peptidoglycan and the uh, their thickness one could actually uh, get an idea for these are gram positive or gram negative uh, bacteria so while these gram positive bacteria they have a large amount of peptidoglycan so in addition to plasma membrane you have very thick a layer of these peptidoglycans uh, but in case of uh, other group of bacteria which is known as uh, gram negative bacteria uh, you will find uh, you know a slight change over there because uh, in addition to the uh, having less peptidoglycan they are also having additional layer of a membrane which is uh, outer membrane so uh, so let's keep comparing uh, these uh, bacterial cell wall composition and differences uh, in two group of bacteria gram positive or gram negative and uh, the gram positive while they are more simple uh, they have the thicker layer of peptidoglycan and the plasma membrane but the gram negative they are more complex actually uh, with uh, three sandwich type of uh, uh, you composition where you have the uh, thin layer of peptidoglycan but you also have uh, an outer membrane in addition to plasma membrane and that outer membrane that contains lipopolysaccharides which is uh, you know mix of carbohydrates along with the lipids so that makes it slightly more complex uh, you know overall cell wall structure and therefore this information of uh, cell wall composition of gram positive or gram negative type of bacteria uh, is being used for the staining methods and uh, what i'm just mentioning referring here gram positive or gram negative that is essentially one of the staining method developed with the name of a scientist uh, which helps to define the composition of these cell wall and how these bacteria can show different coloration patterns when you stain these bacteria so uh, yeah so i think you know these are really uh, complex membrane structure which is we don't have to study in, in that ultra level uh, structural details but i'm just trying to convey you the uh, very basic organization for the composition of gram positive and gram negative uh, bacteria uh, which will be helpful when we will talk about the staining procedures what can be used for the uh, gram positive or gram negative all right so uh, as i just showed you uh, the details uh, now you can see more uh, uh, sketch of these uh, where we have now uh, uh, you know both gram positive and gram negative you can see these uh, bacteria but uh, if you look at them in the microscope they show different coloration and this concept of staining was developed by a scientist uh, which was a danish scientist named uh, hans christine gram and he thought you know uh, that first way of treatment to the patients when patient comes with a bacterial infection how to provide them the first uh, level of uh, treatment you know to start with and that's where uh, thinking about a staining method which could differentiate these bacteria uh, can be very powerful so uh, yeah so in in this particular case just by looking at the composition of these uh, membrane uh, now you have clear idea that you know the gram positive while they have the thick layer of 
peptidoglycans, the gram negatives, they have thinner layer of peptidoglycans uh, shown here. They also have an outer membrane, which was missing in the case of gram positive bacteria. Now these uh, gram positive bacteria, these are purple or violet colored and gram negative, these are pink color. Now, uh, how these color come that is uh, requires different steps of a staining procedure and based on those staining, then you can determine that which one looks purple or violet, which one looks the pink color. And accordingly, you can mention is that the gram positive or gram negative bacteria. So uh, some of our course TAs of previous year, they have recorded this uh, demonstration of the gram staining, which I'm going to show you shortly. Uh, but just to emphasize that it is very important to know about the staining pattern of uh, these bacteria. Uh, so, uh, you know, to begin with for a patient who is infected with any type of bacterial uh, disease, uh, the clinicians want to know that what should be the antibiotics which they should be, uh, you know, using against these pathogens. And that's where if they know that this is a, you know, uh, gram positive, sometimes they are more resistant to the antibiotics. Or if it is going to be, uh, uh, you know, some gram positive bacteria, they are also showing resistance to some of the antibiotics. So some of these information could be helpful for the clinicians to decide what uh, broad spectrum antibiotic they can start with. Uh, you might have heard about penicillin, which is one of the uh, very popular antibiotic, right? And that inhibits the peptidoglycan uh, cross-linking, especially in the gram-positive bacteria. And likewise, different antibiotics, they work on the principle of how to inhibit, uh, you know, the part of different cell work compositions of these bacteria or application machinery of these bacteria. And accordingly, they act on, uh, you know, uh, to inhibit these gram positive or gram negative bacteria. Let us watch this uh, uh, live demo of uh, performing the uh, staining to know that which bacteria is gram positive or which is gram negative. Let us get started with gram staining. This is the bacterial culture that we are going to use for making the smear. This is a clean glass slide. This is a nichrome loop, which is going to be used to make the smear on the slide. This is a spirit lamp, which we are going to use for heat fixation step. First, we will sterilize this two, uh, loop so that there is no contamination in the bacterial culture. We will let it cool so that the cells do not die because if we, in case if we dip the hot loop. We will take a loop full of culture and make the smear on the slide. We will first let it air dry. Once the smear air dries, we will use it to heat fix the smear. The heat fixation step is done so that the cells get stuck onto the slide and do not get washed off when we wash the slide. After the heat fixation step, we will add crystal violet for one minute. After one minute, we will wash off the stain and then add Gram's iodine. The Gram's iodine forms a complex with crystal violet and gets stuck to the bacterial cell walls. So when we wash, wash the smear with decolorizer, the Gram positive bacterial cells stay violet and the Gram negative cells lose the primary stain, that is the crystal violet and then get stained with the second counter stain, which is the saffronin. We will now add decolorizer, which is acetone alcohol.
After a few seconds, we will wash off the decolorizer. We will now add saffronin. After two minutes, we will wash off the saffronin. We will let the smear get air dried. Once the smear has dried, we will add immersion oil and observe the smear under oil immersion lens of the microscope. For gram positive bacteria, we will see uh, cocci in clusters in purple. And if we have gram negative bacterial cells, then we will observe red cells. That was all for gram staining. Thank you. All right. Thank you, TS. And uh, I hope all of you got an idea that how series of experimental steps to be performed. And at the end, then you can see in the microscope that uh, how these uh, color look like for these bacteria. Let us now talk about the eukaryotic cells. So we've already discussed about the prokaryotic cell uh, where you have seen that the nucleus was almost floating in the cytoplasm and uh, does not have any defined nuclear membrane. Whereas in case of uh, the eukaryotic cell, as you can see, the nucleus is defined with the uh, nuclear membrane. And inside the nucleus, there is a nuclei as well. And now uh, this nuclear membrane, which is double uh, membrane structure, all the uh, genetic material uh, is lying within that uh, particular uh, membrane structure. Additionally, we have uh, other endomembranous structure like endoplasmic reticulum and sometimes ribosomes are on top of the ER that is known as rough endoplasmic reticulum or RER or a smooth endoplasmic reticulum and there is no ribosome attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Then we have these Golgi bodies or Golgi complexes which also help in the transport of the protein and these ribosomes which are uh, the organelle to synthesize these protein. We have this mitochondria, which is the ATP generation powerhouse. While most of the genes are residing in the nucleus, but there are few genes which are also uh, residing in the mitochondria. Peroxisome is another organelle which is there to catalyze. Uh, Hydrogen peroxide and enzyme like catalysts are there. These are the microvilli. You know, eukaryotic cell have uh, this microtubule and that contain the centriole. So that makes them different than the um, prokaryotic cells. I'll talk about uh, each one of these organelles in some more detail uh, as I talk about one by one for each one of these um, organelles and what their functions are. But the major difference is what you can uh, see as of now that U term comes like the true carry-on is nucleus. So the eukaryotic cell have the true nucleus whereas the prokaryotes they have the primitive nucleus and do, does not have the uh, membrane enclosing the nuclear contents. Now eukaryotic cells could be of two types. One is the animal cells or other could be plant cells. While most of the organelle which we will be talking uh, have the similar function in whether we talk about uh, animal cell or we talk, talk about plant cell, but there are few organelle which is quite uh, distinct and they provide some ability to these cells for coping up with different uh, specialized uh, functions 
in animal cell all the plant cells so we have talked about endoplasmic reticulum uh, this is a flagellum centrosome cytoskeletal uh, material microvilli peroxisomes lysosomes mitochondria Gal golgi operators ribosomes plasma membrane and nucleus with the nuclear membrane the plant cell also have a uh, similar structure but they have few distinct things like there is a cell wall plasmodesmata which is provides uh, the connectivity with, with other cells uh, then they also have plasma membrane peroxisomes mitochondria golgi apparatus nucleus endoplasmic reticulum ribosome central vacuole is something new here which is uh, having all the deposits or the waste material can be collected here cytoskeletal skeletal materials are there as well chloroplast is of course one of the very specialized organelle in the plant cell only in addition to the nucleus which contains the genetic material and genes chloroplast also contains dna and the uh, some of the uh, genes so now in plant cell ideally you got nucleus you got mitochondria and chloroplast all three of them may have their own unique genes let us now define some of these terminology and also talk about uh, role of these organelle in some detail so cytoplasm is if you think about a balloon uh, within which there is a liquid filled right so that is the cytoplasm which is a uh, aqueous material and it also known as cytosol which contains protein complexes such as ribosome along with floating cytoskeletal material and the cytoskeleton what they are uh, like the way in human we have a skeleton which gives us the shape and ability to stand likewise the cytoskeletal material are the uh, microtubules and component which we talked they are able to provide a framework to the cell and provides a positioning to the organelles and the compartments can be seen in the cell they also help in the intracellular transport as well as the movement of the chromosomes vacuole which I, which i just showed you in the plant which is quite distinct uh, vacuole helps in digestion of the macromolecules also sometime it is works as a reservoir for the waste products and nutrients so i'll i'll go in one by one in each of these organelles and their function so plasma membrane uh, it provides uh, like an outer boundary a separation where uh, the cell can now conceive the signal from the outside external environment so it helps into the transport of material from inside to outside and also receiving the signal from outside and conveying that to the cell just to uh, uh, you know pinpoint here that all the figures have been taken from book campbell which is prescribed book uh, for this course and the figure numbers are mentioned so that you can also follow those to the respective pages so a uh, nuclear membrane uh, that is a double uh, membrane structure which is which contains the most prominent organelle the nucleus and nucleus is the uh, storehouse of all the genetic component genetic material uh, and also therefore it provide a site for dna replication to happen uh, rna synthesis can happen over there so all of these are important activity which are governed from the nucleus then we have these endoplasmic reticulum which is uh works like a fedex system for transport uh, and communicating the uh, you know messages and, and and ideas from one to other place right like fedex uh so here there is a network of a smooth endoplasmic reticulum to the rough endoplasmic reticulum and rough endoplasmic reticulum as i mentioned earlier when there is a ribosome attached to the uh, endoplasmic reticulum ribosome is the site for protein synthesis and so now the rer uh, when when we say which is the rough endoplasmic reticulum that also contains the uh, protein is going to be synthesized with the ribosome and a smooth endoplasmic reticulum is not going to be involved in the protein synthesis part but it actually helps into the packaging of these proteins into the vesicle which further being carried with the endomembranous system linked to the golgi vesicles or golgi complexes which is more of the flattened structures and like a post office when it's going to now take the contents out so exocytosis or exo means out cytosis means out of the cell is going to help the protein to transport outside 
other organelle is peroxisome which is uh, uh, contains a high amount of enzyme like catalase which helps to degrade the hydrogen peroxide it also involved in breaking down the fatty acid uh, molecules unlike mitochondria and uh, some other organelle like nucleus uh, it is single membrane uh, organelle and does not have any its own gene or genetic system mitochondria is of course uh, very important probably one of the most important organelle which is also double membrane structure and it contains its own circular dna uh, which is provides its you know lot of unique uh, abilities uh, within the cell itself uh, it has its own unique uh, activity which it can govern it is uh, the site for the oxidative metabolism so provides the energy required for the cell Uh, the inner membrane of the mitochondria that is the main site for the atp synthesis now which are the key distinguishing features of the plants and animal cells uh, we have seen both uh, plant cell animal cell structures now uh, ideally what you can see the like cell wall uh, was very uh, distinct in the plant cell that is present there animal cell it is absent vacuole was very large in the plant cell it is absent in the animal cell plastid is only present in the plant cell which is absent in the animal cell glyoxysome is present in the plant cell absent in the animal lysosome is absent here where is present in the animal cell centrosome is absent in the plant cell present in the animal cell i am showing you here reference uh, of two different uh, video clips uh, of showing plant and animal cell how they look in the uh, microscopy and this is taken from the book video differential interference contrast microscopy is used here to visualize mitotic events in a lung cell grown in tissue culture individual chromosomes become visible as the replicated chromatin starts to condense the two chromatids in each chromosome remain paired as the chromosomes become aligned on the metaphase plate The chromatids then separate and get pulled by the mitotic spindle into the two nascent daughter cells. The chromatin decondenses as the two new nuclei form, and cytokinesis continues to constrict the remaining cytoplasmic bridge until the two daughter cells become separated. As this plant cell, taken from a lily, prepares for division, The chromosomes first condense. Next, the mitotic spindle lines them up in the center of the cell. At the metaphase to anaphase transition, the sister chromatids of every chromosome pair separate suddenly in striking synchrony. The chromosomes are pulled along the microtubules of the spindle to opposite ends of the cell. After chromosome separation, membrane vesicles line up in the center and fuse with each other to form the new plasma membranes that separate the two daughter cells. At telophase, the chromosomes decondense in the newly formed nuclei. All right, so uh, while you see those beautiful pictures in the book Uh, they are actually coming from these microscopic observation and those are uh, more creatively presented to give you the visual uh, feel of all these organelle and how they look in the cell but inside the cell this is the, the microscopic uh, images what you can see so for understanding now the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells let us discuss about three domains of life the diverse uh, group of organisms they have been divided into three fundamental groups bacteria archaea and eukarya these are based on their biochemical characteristics and uh, a scientist named carl wuz he used uh, 16s ribosomal rna as a way to classify and broadly group uh, these the uh, organism and found that they could be grouped into three domains domain eukarya domain archaea and domain bacteria and these fundamental groups these are known as domains so you have already studied about uh, bacteria which is uh, prokaryote 
and we have discussed about eukarya which is under eukaryote additionally there is one more group known as archaea so both archaea and uh, bacteria could be grouped under prokaryotes and eukarya under eukaryotes there are different type of bacteria like green non sulfur bacteria spirochetes clamidia green sulfur bacteria cyanobacteria all of them grouped under bacteria archaea different examples are halophiles the one which likes to live in the uh, salt environment thermophile the one which likes or loves the uh, heat sulfolobus in the sulfur environment methanobacterium with the uh, methane uh, gas loving environment these are various type of extremophile the uh, these organisms can live in the extreme conditions where other organisms cannot survive and these are grouped under archaea both broadly are under prokaryotes eukaryotes are all other uh, evolved group of organism which includes uh, animals plants fungus different type of algae and the molds ciliates diatoms dinoflagellates trypanosome leishmania etc all of them comes from one common ancestor of all life could be around 3.5 to 4 billion years ago got originated so while we discussed about two groups the prokaryotes especially bacteria and the eukaryotes we have just learned about a third group third domain which is uh, archaea which is also prokaryote but it shows a common characteristic few things are common with the uh, prokaryotes and few are common with the eukaryote that's why it is considered in between these uh, two groups but it is shows more similarity towards the eukaryotes than bacteria so these archaea and the eukaryotes they both have their own genome which encodes uh, with the uh, characteristics protein known as histones uh so these histone proteins which are uh, eight in number they attach to the dna molecules and form a complex known as nucleosome in eukaryotes so while that nucleosome is lacking in the bacteria but uh, these archaea they contains these histone proteins so rna and protein components of these uh, archaea and their ribosomes they are more similar to the eukaryotes as compared to the bacteria so overall now what you have to start understanding and visualizing that <clears throat> there is a common link in between the uh, bacteria and the uh, eukaryotes and archaea shows many of these characteristics uh, few shared with the prokaryotes few shared with the eukaryotes so just to summarize today's lecture uh, we started discussing about need for a partnership between biologists and engineers and how i hope you are convinced that there are many problems uh, which are beyond the boundaries and all the intellectuals have to contribute together we then started studying about different processes and properties which are associated with the life and i tried to highlight couple of examples and the uh, different diversities of these living organisms we then started talking about prokaryotic cell and eukaryotic cell some of their organelle and their function cell which is very crucial that is the uh, basic unit of structure and function and how different organelles they provide uh, a specific role but together they are uh, making the component which is much beyond their individual roles and that's how the cell is the uh, functional unit of uh, life so uh, i hope you know you are uh, now at least started uh appreciating understanding uh the importance of the cell and different type of microbes uh while you will have a dedicated lecture about bacteria and viruses from professor rahul purva later on uh, i'll continue by lecture about uh the cell and their organelles but more importantly the cell cycle and its regulation how that is so crucial for different physiological processes uh you can use the book campbell which is the reference book for this uh, course also i have used some examples from this particular uh, book new biology for 21st century as a reference so what is going to be next uh, along with this video i am also providing you the handout which is in the description of this video 
you can uh, download the handout. I'm also providing you uh, a feedback uh, form or the Google form where you can actually put your questions from different slides or any specific question which you would like me to address in tomorrow's live session. So uh, please fill those forms after watching this lecture. And then, of course, we'll be uh, meeting uh, again and we'll talk about the cell cycle in the next lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.